Hi, I'm K.S. Garner, and you're listening to the Solo Nerdberg Podcast. Today, I'll be speaking with children's author and activist Sarah Woodard. Welcome, Sarah. Hey, K.S. Thanks so much for having me. Well, thank you for joining us, and I want to give a shout out to uh, Barney Smith, who was the one that connected us together. Yes. I don't know if he's listening, but hey, Barney. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, hey, Barney. (laughs) But uh, outside my introduction, who is Sarah Woodard, and what are you about? So... I am, as you said, I'm a children's author and an activist, and all of my books are activist topics in nature. Um, Everything from animal rights to civil rights, um, nature, the environment, you name it. If, If somebody has an opinion on it in an activist sort of way, there's probably a book, if not out already, then in the queue, as I call it. Um... And I'm really, I, I'm just all about the fact that kids are like, they're like little magical beings that they can just like, they change the adults around them. And in doing so, they change the entire world. And I cannot imagine a better way to connect with them and to, to make a difference in a positive way for the planet before it's my turn to leave the planet than to, to share this to share these books with them. I, I think that that's just like such a blessing that I'm able to do that. Yeah, I think it's important to get children to provide them with information as like soon as possible. I mean, not the dumping on them, but, you know, explaining things to them as big, like down to as, as simple as possible, like in, what, like in your children's books, as simple as possible. And because I don't think, it's difficult for them to understand it if you explain it to them, especially in a way Agreed. that they understand it and that they can understand it, that they can absorb it in a way that makes sense to them. So Agreed. And, and I think, you know, to their credit, parents sometimes steer kids away from certain topics because they might be scary or difficult. And, and I get it, right? Like you, you want kids to feel safe and secure in the world. And I totally get it. But I also believe that there's a way to talk about those things, particularly if the children are asking without it being scary and terrible and horrible, even if it feels scary and terrible and horrible to you as the grown up, There are ways that you can share that information and, and that interest of your child's in a way that they feel empowered rather than scared. And that's really the important thing because that's how people, that for anyone of any age to make changes, they have to feel empowered. And so a big thing in my books is at the end of the book, you know, the kids have learned some information. They're all fiction, but they've learned some information. They've maybe got, you know, some interest has sparked in them and they feel empowered about how to do something, right? Maybe they feel like, hey, you know, I really love trees and I, I really do get upset. Just like Emily Jane in that book, I really do get upset when I see, you know, trees being cut down. I know I can go plant some trees, right? That they don't just go, oh, it's terrible. They're chopping down the trees and it's awful. Maybe it does feel that way at first, but when they're done reading the book, it's, oh, but I can do with it. There's an action I can take. And I think that's really the key point. Um, and the world feels less scary and horrible to grownups too, when we feel empowered to do something about it, right? So, yeah, when we, when we have a way of, instead of just complaining about it, we can take our concerns and make them more productive. Right. And exactly. I feel like a lot of, you know, a lot of us, who are now adults and a lot of teenagers, I think is that we complain about a lot of things because we don't really know how to resolve it in a way. Right. So doing the children's books, it gets them, like I said before, like we both mentioned it, get them early, start as soon as possible, knowing how to do stuff. So they're not asking when they're 16, 17, 18 years old or 25, 26, 30 in my case, and wondering how are we supposed to do 40, stuff? 40, 50, 70, right, yeah. Exactly, how are we supposed to do stuff? But, um, right, right, they, and, they, and they don't, they're not just how, but they feel like they can, right? Yeah. Like you may not know how, but if you feel like you can, you can figure out how, right? So that, that kid who at age you know, four or five read this book and decide, okay, I, I'm gonna go plant some trees or whatever, 16, 17, 18, maybe they're still distressed about this same topic, because they're seeing it on a larger scale than they saw it when they were four, Uh but they can go, okay, well, let me see, is there a nonprofit I can get involved in? Can I start a nonprofit? Can I do this? Can I do that? Right. They start to look for solutions 
rather than just going, well, this sucks. <laughs> right? Exactly. It, I feel like it could actually alleviate some of that teen angst thing that goes on. Right. So <laughs> yeah, I, if I knew more on how to do stuff when I was a teenager, I wouldn't have been so so angsty. I definitely would have been. I think most teenagers feel that way. I think, I mean, there's a lot, you know, of life changes that go on as a teenager, but I think that a lot of teens, if they felt empowered, would feel a lot less distressed than they do. Exactly. Um, but your most, I believe is your most recent book is Tango and Jim Find Love that came out. Um, right. Well, January. what, so one just came out um, a couple of days ago that is, um, Ke uh, Kelly's goodbye, which is about saying goodbye to a, a beloved pet that has passed on. Um, and then right before that was Tango and Jim Find Love. And that one is actually about a soldier who has PTSD and walks into an animal shelter one day and adopts a dog who has been there for a long time because he displays a lot of just fear and cowering. And he's, you know, so he's not like the first one anybody wants to adopt because he's not playful and happy and bouncy. Uh -huh. But this soldier kind of sees his own fear reflected back to him in the dog and they together, they help each other feel. Oh, okay. I was just looking at your, uh, your Amazon page and it's so many, you can tell by in the background in the videos, <laughs> so many books. I was like, which one it is, is the most? It's like 45 one? now, I think. Okay. Um, but okay. So your most recent one is, what was, I'm sorry, what was the name of it again? Kelly's Goodbye is the one that just came out. Kelly's Goodbye. Okay. Yeah. So, and I'm, I'm assuming that deals with, uh, with death. Yeah. So that's okay. about saying goodbye to a beloved pet that has passed on. Okay. Um, actually that was, re someone requested that I write a book like that, um, quite a while ago and I did write it. And then it just kind of kept getting pushed aside for other topics that kind of rose to the surface. Mm -hmm. Like, honestly, the hardest thing, the biggest challenge I have is like, I have like 30 something books that have been written and edited and are in the queue for my illustrator. And the hardest thing of, of my job is figuring out what to send next. Like they're all important. They all need to be done right now. And it doesn't work that way. Um, and so, yeah, so this one about saying Kelly's goodbye, saying goodbye to a lost pet, it, it just, um, it kept getting pushed down for a while, but my, one of my pets, one of my cats actually passed um, just a few weeks ago. And so after he passed, I was like, all right, this one has to come out. And I changed it so that it was actually about more about him. Mm -hmm. um, it's sort of in his memory and um, which was also very healing for me. And then I do have another one that's about a dog as well, but I have no idea when that'll be out because like I said, things just sort of. <laughs> okay. Well, with, with, with that book and pretty much with all your books, um, I want, I try to narrow it down just to, to one, cause I didn't want to say all of them. But um, how can you elaborate more on your creative process when you're oh, writing yeah. a book? So like just a thought in your head to how do you appropriately express your message to your young readers and then marketing the book? Okay, so multiple part question there. All right, so first, um, as far as the creative process goes, so usually what happens is I will see something on the news or on social media or out in the world that just kind of like, nags at me either it like makes me really irritated or I'm like oh my god that's beautiful or something it's it evokes a reaction of some kind which with me I admit does not take much um and then I'll kind of just lift it up I lift it up to spirit and I say is this a book if it is like I'm a recipient and I just wait I don't lock myself in a room and sit down and try to write that's just a good way to drive yourself into writer's block if you didn't already have it and make yourself frustrated I just do my life and eventually, if that's meant to be a book, I get, I call it the whisper and I, and I'll get either like the character's name or like the first line of the story or something. And when I get that, I sit down and the book basically writes itself because it's not really me. I'm like the vessel, but the words aren't really mine. Um, and then it goes to my editor and then it goes in the queue and eventually it goes to my illustrator and then it gets published. And then is the second part of your question, the marketing. And that is honestly where I spend most of my days is, is on the marketing. Like it, it, as you know, from, from having a podcast that you try to, you know, get out to people and, and, you know, draw more listeners to the marketing is a significant effort. And I, I hire coaches and I'm always trying to find like that next, that next level, that next piece that I'm missing. So like, um, right now I, I actually just brought my 
my re my beautiful new website online and um, there's a free download on there for folks um, eight ways to um, help your child find their passion and purpose and like we've been talking about finding that passion and purpose connects them to something that they can feel empowered to change um, and that's where activism all begins so there's a free download on there there's all sorts of good information um, so i just brought that online i you know it's it's always stuff right there's social media like there's always yeah marketing marketing is a big huge piece of it and it's the piece i really i like the least i wish i could just write the books and leave it there but it doesn't work that way <laughs> yeah i totally understand like when i send out emails for people like that i want to interview or maybe sponsors that's like the entire day for me yeah. because i have to sit there and wait for them to reply back and i don't want them sitting there all day and but i have so many other things that i have to do but this is a big crucial part of making connections and pretty much selling not even the podcast and not even my own writing but like selling myself in a way right. which can be yep. difficult for me as a as a creative and um also connected with what you just said about how you're the vessel and the books kind of just write themselves because that's how I am with my writing I always tell people that my characters kind of just tell me what they want to do like yeah where is it they want to go and where the story's going to go and I, I can't really say like where like I can envision how it's going to end and where they are but they're the ones telling me how they feel and what they want to do or what works in the scene and what doesn't. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah that's pretty much, that's pretty much where I am with my stuff. Um, so how do you sell the books to parents in the schools? Like how has your experience been getting them on board to purchasing books for their children? It's, it's, it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Mm -hmm. um <laughs> you know and and honestly any sales process really is right like you know you you look around at other people like other creative social medias and i i fall into this trap all the time and i look at it i'm like wow like they're so successful and blah 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 but the fact is we don't really know what's going on behind that social media account and they may just be doing a really good job of looking that way which is good they need to because that's part of the sales process right you have to mm -hmm. make people believe that you are already successful in order to actually be successful because that is how psychology works, <laughs> and, <laughs> right? And, but it's, it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint, right? It's, it's, they are exposed to me and what I do enough times in enough different ways that they eventually go, yes, she's cool, we like her, let's try this one book. And then maybe they, they like that one book and they try a different book or whatever, or maybe, you know, one that I came out with really resonates for them. And they try that and they go, oh, this is what she's all about. Let's try another book, right? Like it, it's, it's a, it's a marathon, mm -hmm. several marathons, a decathlon maybe. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, what advice would you offer to other authors? You wish someone would have told you when you first got started. Well, this one may come as a surprise, but when I first got started, there's, I mean, and there's still a lot of debate about the whole ISBN thing, right? And when I first got started, I was convinced that you had to pay for an ISBN. I was convinced. So I did. I spent the money on the ISBN and the barcode and da 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 da, da and the whole nine yards, only to find out when I started to shop that book around to bookstores that they only wanted to buy copies directly from me anyways, even though with my purchase of the ISBN, they could have got it through their distrib distributor. Okay, so what did I spend this money for? So then I started doing the free ISBNs and that's worked out much better. It's a lot cheaper. The bookstores still buy copies off me and oh, um, secret tip to all of you who self-publish through KDP, listen up. Um, Actually, after eight weeks, those titles that you have a free ISBN through KDP can be purchased through the exact same distribution that they would be able to get it if you paid for the ISBN. So there is zero advantage to spending your hard-earned dollars on an ISBN. Zero, in my opinion. Oh, wow. Yeah. 
So that's my tip for all of you creative, for all of you authors who are trying to get your work out in the world. First of all, edit, but I hope all of you would know that. But the thing that I wish people had told me was you do not need to waste your money on ISBNs. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it takes, like you said, it's eight weeks, but what's eight weeks over the lifespan of a book, mm-hmm. you know? In eight weeks, any bookstore can go into the same distribution and buy the books. Why are you paying for this? <laughs> so are you more successful or not successful? I would just say, um, do you see, I guess, more purchases through through you, or like through your websites and maybe hand-to-hand versus like through M, like Kindle and um, so, as other places? I don't, so I don't, t- I, except for farmer's markets, I don't do person-to-person sales. I direct everyone to go on Amazon because truth be told, if you sit down and do the math, as much as it seems like you're making not that much money, it's still more than I make if I sell it in person. Mm. Um, but I do sell in person, like at farmer's markets and stuff like that. Um, or other, you know, other like book events. Um, although with COVID, there hasn't been many of those, obviously. But yeah, um, you know. But generally speaking, I try to tell people to go on Amazon. Um, I I make more money that way, and quite frankly, it's easier for them. It ships directly to their house or wherever they want it to go if they're buying it as a gift, and it gets there a lot faster. Like my in my if I order author copies the same day that you order your copy on Amazon. You will have your copy in less than a week. My author copies, eh, a week and a half, two weeks, they get here eventually. And then I have to eat, then I have to connect with you to make this in-person transaction happen. You could have already had the book read three or four times. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, do you actually, well, I mentioned selling the books to parents in the schools but do you actually sell them to schools or do schools actually do buy them i honestly don't so unfortunately amazon's um reporting doesn't have that level of granularity that i know who's purchasing them Mm -hmm. um and oftentimes when i do in-person stuff people just buy the book and walk away and i don't have the chance to ask like who are you and what do you do because it's just a flow of people in and out right um so I don't know for sure if they're in schools I'd like to believe they are um but I don't really have any way to have insight into that unfortunately okay. did it, I mean did they tell you that people buy them in bulk or anything like that from like maybe your analytics it analytics? no it tells you it tells you like quantities that have been purchased but it doesn't tell you if it's like from the same place or not uh-huh. it just tells you like you know X number of this copies were purchased on this day, but that could be from, from one, one, one buyer or from 10. It, you don't get that level of, of, of insight. Unfortunately, that's the one thing, that's the one thing that I would like to know more, but it's okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, somebody could have them for their own personal library for their kids. Cause a lot of people buy children's books for their own children to have at exactly. home and exactly. doesn't have to be at school. I was just wondering, I was like, this would be nice to have at a school where they're trying to teach them how to do this, how, like how to deal with and resolve these certain issues. Absolutely. Nice. Absolutely. And I, that, that is definitely part of my vision. And I, I hope that that is what's happening. I, if the, if anyone listening is a teacher and you're using these in your classroom, please tell me because I would love to (laughs) actually know. Um, but yeah, unfortunately the reporting doesn't have that level of insight. So it's, it's, I can't really tell, unfortunately. Okay. Well, my last question for you, Sarah, is what is your idea of success? So I ask that because as creators, if we're not getting regular paychecks from a full-time job or making consistent revenue from our art, we're considered failures. Many of us will put our dreams and projects on a back burner or give them up altogether because this career can be highly intimidating and competitive. So what is your idea of quote-unquote success? I think that's a really good question and a really valid reason for asking it because, you know, part of, part of my definition for success is that my author career will pay the bills. Of course. I think we all want that, right? We all want to make money doing the thing that we love, whether that's a creative thing or not. We all want to just make money doing something we love. Um, but also for me, success is about joy. It, 
and yes, you need the money to pay the bills, of course, and, and to have fun with, right? Like money isn't just about paying the bills. Money is about fun too. But success, money is only one piece. And joy for me is sort of like the umbrella under which all of the other pieces of success fall, including money. Um, you know, I, and if, in using that definition, I've at least got a good chunk of the umbrella. Um, you know, I, I love getting up every day knowing that I'm an author. I love getting up every day feeling like my work is in the world making a difference. I love getting up every day waiting for those emails from my illustrator with the day's pages that he's drawn. Um, you know, I love, I love waiting for that inspiration to, to hit me and then sitting down and writing. I even love getting feedback from my editor, even when she's like, Sarah, you can do so much better. I still, <laughs> she's always, when she says that she's right. And I appreciate the push, you know, um, I think it's, and I think it's important to be open to that, but to me, joy is, is sort of the overarching thing that you have to have in order to have success. You can have all of, you can have all the money in the world, but still hate life. And then that's not, who cares? Like, uh-huh exactly exactly yeah i've i've been lacking uh joy and motivation lately with my things and i'm just a lot of it had to do with money so it's like now that i have regained the financial stability i can relax and i can actually enjoy what i'm creating again i don't have to worry about other things i can really just concentrate on what it is that i want to do and find that joy again so yeah I, it's just being happy about what you're doing and maybe even reevaluating that you may have to cut some stuff out you may have to take on more things as well it's mm-hmm. just so you can f- feel fulfilled and have that joy again so that's and, why and I'm i think right being now. open to other avenues too like mm-hmm. when i first sort of started down this path of the author career like back in 2017 I figured I could just, you know, write some books and people would buy them and I could sit at home with my cats all day and like make the money. But the fact of the matter is very few authors make enough money just from their books to have it be their only source of income. You can have your author career be your sole source of income if you're open to other things like visiting schools or giving speeches about things that you're expert in. If you're a nonfiction writer, whatever that is, if you're a fiction writer, Like in my case, I talk about activism and children, right? But whatever that, you know, thing is that you can talk about, being open to those other areas. If, you know, if you're, if you're an artist, maybe you can also teach art or or teach writing or like other ways to use your passion, your joy, your gift that aren't just the art thing, the thing that you create, right? And being open to that can help to make whatever that creative piece is a full career and not just like oh yeah I sold a book like <laughs> yeah yeah I, I totally understand I'm I'm actually looking into maybe doing uh like panels or um just I guess I wouldn't call it speeches I, mean, I forgot what it's I can't think of what it's called uh maybe seminars or something like that maybe on like yeah not yeah just with podcasting and but maybe like with writing and possibly public speaking because doing these interviews has helped me sure. with speaking to people. Whereas before I wanted to do the writing mostly and the podcast here at home to avoid people. But now that I'm doing yes. the Oh, I so relate to that. <laughs> now that I'm doing the interviews, um, I, I, I enjoy talking to people now. And now it's just yeah. actually talking to them in person. So it's my, it's my issue because we've been separated from each other for what, three, going, what, two, three years now. So it's getting used well, to I think it's actually a year and a half, again. but it feels like two, three. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah it, it feels like forever to me. Yeah. It feels like forever. Yes. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head there, you know, like you have, that's a gift you can share. You, you are not the only introvert who does not want to leave the house. But that's a gift. Like you can teach other introverts that like, here's a, you know, here's a way that I was able to enjoy, learn to enjoy people and to feel safe interacting with them. And maybe they then host their own podcast that helps someone else. Right. Like, I think that's a really, and that, and again, that would be a way you bring in money 
that isn't the podcast specifically or isn't your writing specifically, but it's connected, it's related, it's all part of who you are and how you show up in the world. Yeah, exactly. Um, but is there anything else that you wanted to touch on about your books or any type of um, maybe nonprofit programs that you wanted to share or talk about? Sarah? So, yeah, so um, a couple things. Um, so first is I always, um, for my whole life, I've always done um, 10% of whatever profit I have to charity. Um, this year, I started doing a charity of the month. So um, on my social media, you'll see that for this month, it's Harmony Farm Sanctuary and Wellness Center, which is, I forget where in Vermont it is, but up north in Vermont somewhere. And they're a wonderful, wonderful organization. Um, and so, yeah, so it's a different one every month. And I encourage people to, you know, follow me on social media and buy books to support these organizations. Um, and then I also want to just encourage people to hop on over to my website, which is sarahwoodardauthoress.wordpress.com and grab that free download for the uh, eight ways to help your child find their passion and purpose. Um, and you know, just check that out and enjoy it. Just enjoy like the curiosity with your kids. Like they're just, they're magical and just step back and like, just enjoy that. Go along for the ride. Uh, do you have a Patreon as well? I believe I saw it. I on do. Yes. Thank you for plugging the Patreon. I was like, I don't want to plug everything. So thank you. Yes, no, please I do. do. Please plug everything. Okay. So yes, I do. <laughs> I do have a Patreon. Um, I think it goes from one to $10 right now. And definitely any way that, you know, check out the different offerings at the different levels at seven, at $7 and above you get coloring pages, which I think is pretty fun. Um, but you know, whatever, any support that people can lend helps me do that much more. So um, yeah, what else, what else can I plug? Um, oh. That might be it. If you, have, if you have any of the plugs you want to throw in there for me, go for it. <laughs> no, I, I think that's it. It's the, the WordPress and then the Patreon. And then I'm going to list all your socials in there as yes. well. Um, yes. I believe Carlos Lopez is your illustrator, right? He um, is. He is amazing. He's in it. Venezuela. Okay. Um, yeah, he's in Venezuela. We met through the magic of the internet. And... and um, I've never, I've never even done a zoom with him because their infrastructure is so bad that his internet is not up to that task. Oh, okay. um, but it doesn't matter. Like, I feel like he and I are soul connected and he just, he gets it. He gets, he gets the work, he gets me, he gets the mission and he just, he brings the magic. He really does. Like without his drawings, it would be words on a page. It would just be words on a page. He, he takes those words on a page and he transforms them into a journey, into an adventure. I, yeah, I couldn't do this without him. <laughs> All right. Well, again, I want to thank children's author and activist Sarah Woodard for joining us today. I highly recommend our listeners to give Sarah's books a look, share, and purchase if they can. All of Sarah's socials will be listed alongside her website and Patreon in this episode's details. Again, I'm K.S. Garner, and you have been listening to the Solo Nerdbook Podcast. Thank you.